Hello, I'm John Micklethwaite in Davos. If you are interested in competition between the United States and China, if you're interested in the rise of protectionism and its consequence for the world economy, then there is no better place to look than Singapore, the free trading hub that has somehow managed to remain the friend of both China and America, at least until now. Please join me for a conversation with Li Sien Lung, the long-standing Prime Minister of Singapore. You sit in the middle of two big things. You have the US-China relationship, yes. or the lack of it, yes. and you also have this current tide of nationalism and protectionism. Yes. You are an unusually yes. open free trading economy, yes. very reliant on free trade. Yes. Can, we, can we begin with the US and China? You yes. said that, that you warned that Southeast Asian countries may be forced to choose between the US and China if the world economy splits into blocks. Yes. Surely that's sort of beginning and surely that choice is now upon you. Well, you have to make certain uh, choices. I mean, for example, if 5G becomes an issue between the two sides, then the countries have to decide which system are you going to take. Mm. And I think different countries will make different decisions. Uh, certainly in the software part of the internet world, if we are talking about Google and Facebook, the Chinese have their equivalents. They have Baidu and uh, Weibo and all the equivalents, but it's a parallel universe. But, that's, well, okay, that's, software. The splinter, that's the splinter net, though, that everyone worries about, that the world is no longer having one uh, global internet. I, 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 I end think up the with original two. idea that it's one globalized net and we all talk to one another and national boundaries are irrelevant uh, was not a realistic one. Governments are not going to allow this, um, and those governments which are able to do something about it will want to have some management of these overwhelming tides and flows, and the Chinese governments have decided to put a lot more resources in this than anybody else. And they've built up their own ecosystem and their own world, and it's kind of connected to the rest of the world, but actually it's almost a walled garden. And it still works. Uh, ideally, we would all be watching YouTube videos, but well, if you can't quite do that, life will have to go on. But when it comes to technology, I think if you bifurcate on technology and I have my chipset and you have yours and I have my supply chain and you have yours, then I think the cost is much higher. Cost in terms of the financial cost of making things, but also cost in terms of technological progress because, and, and interoperability, I, I do need to work across boundaries and I do not want to have to carry one phone for every country I'm visiting. It looks as if you're going to have to carry possibly two phones quite soon if the Americans and the Chinese, it splits along those lines. Well, that could well happen. Can I ask you particularly on that? I mean, you mentioned 5G. You have the issue of Huawei. Yes. Uh, you're rolling out your own 5G thing. Yes. And you have said to the telecom companies, you know, you make up your mind whether to use Huawei or not. Well, we, have, we haven't banned Huawei. What we've said is that we have operational, operational requirements. We've set out our requirements. We've asked the telcos to put in their bids and that we'll evaluate the bids and it'll depend on how, how much they cost, how they perform, and also whether they meet our security requirements. And I think uh, most governments would like to take such an approach. Do you, do you see that sort of implies though that you don't take the immediate American position that Huawei is a security threat either well, in well, terms my of what view it's actually is, doing? It, my view is when you're buying complicated computer systems, the bugs are a feature. And that is so whoever's system you buy. Uh, there will be uh, gaps, there will be weaknesses, there will be vulnerabilities, and you have to live with them. And whoever system you have, you must be able to police it and try your best to keep it secure and appropriate to the purpose to which you put it. So if you're not absolutely confident, you can still use it for a lot of things, but you probably won't use it for top secret communications. And we have to make those trade-offs and those choices. So will most countries. There's nothing the Americans have shown you so far that says, look, that has convinced you that Huawei should be off the table to begin no, with. I, I would take the view that any system I buy has weaknesses which come in with it. And, and if the weaknesses have not yet been exploited, they are soon going to be by everybody. Yes. By the persons who made the system or the countries which did and by the countries who didn't make the system but want to get in. And so we have to uh, guard our entrances. You, 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 it interests me. You have been a very long um, and, and very kind of resourceful and clever ally of the United States for a long time. Um, we, are, and also, we are a security 
cooperation partner. We're not a treaty ally. Yes, but you're also, you, you've, you've been a friend of America. You've also managed to remain a friend of China, it should be said. But what's interesting about this is here the, the, the Americans are saying Huawei is a really important security threat to us. Yes. People like you, also you look at Europe, you've got Germany, yes. Britain, France, yes. all these countries are saying we don't care. You know, what does, it, does that tell you something about what's happened no, to America I, I don't in this think world? That we, the attitude of the NATO countries or of Singapore is that we don't care. We do care. We want secure systems. We take your, your views seriously and if you, any information which you give us, we will study very carefully because America has one of the most capable uh, cyber security as well as cyber operation outfits in the world. But we have to make our own assessments and the assessments have to be based on facts and risks. And having made those assessments, uh, well, we, have, we may have come to a conclusion which is different from what the Americans have come to, but it doesn't mean that we're not concerned about similar issues. If you ask us on security cooperation, certainly we are closer to the US than to China, but in terms of our trade, the Chinese are our biggest trading partner. In terms of our overall relationship, uh, we have deep relationships with both. Where do you feel the particular pressure? Of, you mentioned 5G, but are there other areas where you're slightly being forced to make choices already? Uh, the, I think right now telecoms is a salient -ish area. Uh, on security issues, there will be from time to time pressures on us to take a stand, to make public statements. And we'll have to consider carefully what stand we take because we ha our stand has to be taken as something which conforms with Singapore's national interests and not something which we say because we receive a missive and we've decided to comply. Just to, um, one more on that is in November, Donald Trump asked the 10 ASEAN leaders to the US for a special summit. Yes, in March. In March. That's, and that is going ahead at the moment. Yes, it is. I, I expect to be there. We are supposed to be meeting in Las Vegas on March the 14th for a serious purpose. And the purpose be, being? No, it, it is to meet the US president. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be discussing areas where we can cooperate and do more together. And I hope that Mr. Trump, amidst his many domestic preoccupations, will send a message that Asia is important to him and Southeast Asia has its part in the American scheme of things. I think some people would argue that what's happening is some countries are drifting a bit towards China. You have Malaysia, for instance, has come up with some some statements which would appear to be pushing it in that direction. Do, do you think that ASEAN is slightly, at the moment, I, it's I, moving more to, it's moving for, towards China? I think for all ASEAN countries, China is a big fact of life. China is the biggest trading partner for probably all of us. Uh, it's a very major diplomatic partner. It has a very active dipl diplomatic presence in the region. Um, its investments have become not negligible. Ex outbound investments, its tourism has become not negligible. And uh, we all want to have a good relationship with China and to benefit from China's prosperity and success. So that's, if you ask compared to where we were 20 or 30 years ago, I have no doubt the answer is we all have deeper relations with China. But whether that means we have all turned away from America, I, I would not accept that. Maybe some countries have calibrated their position, but Singapore certainly values our relationship with America as much as ever. Do you worry from Hong Kong's point of view that what is happening there is merely going to antagonize Beijing? I don't think they know quite know what they can do about it. They definitely know that if they go in themselves in a heavy-handed way, it's not going to be a wise thing for them to do. you a couple of things on the China side of the ledger because I'm aware I pushed you harder on the American one so far. The various Southeast Asian nations, you're trying to get China to come up with a kind of code of conduct for the South China Sea. Yes. We are working with, the China, with China in order to negotiate a code of conduct on the South China Sea. Do you think that in some extent the Western expectations there, maybe your expectations are uh, unrealistic. This is the world's second biggest economy, the world's second biggest military power, and the idea that that particular area of the world is not going to be under its control, its 
its effective, its, its zone. Well, well, and certainly to use an old Marxist phrase, the correlation of forces <laughs> is not a very balanced one. <laughs> yes. But um, the countries which have an interest in freedom of navigation and in sovereignty issues in the South China Sea are not just the claimant states, but also others, many other countries, including other superpowers, uh, whose uh, traffic sail through the South China Sea. A large part of the world's oil supplies sail through the South China Sea, from the Middle East to Japan and Far East. In fact, the Chinese themselves have a vested interest in freedom of navigation because as they become big and as they become more integrated in the world, their interests will become like the other superpowers which depend on un in unimpeded freedom of navigation through many troubled parts of the oceans. And so I think that it is not such a straightforward calculation to say it's obviously one-sided and therefore uh, a conclusion is foreordained. Is there, is there a way through it? Do you think that there is a particular... What would be the centre of the, co the Code of Conduct? Is it not stopping vessels? Is it not building any No, the any Code more? of Conduct has to do with what the participating countries do or do not do in advancing their claims and in dealing with um, conflicts or frictions or in incidents on the ground. I don't see it as being very easy to negotiate because you have to... First, you have to de define what you are disagreeing about and where the disagreements yes. pertain. And that's very hard because what's mine is undoubtedly mine and what's yours is up for discussion. Yes. So to define the disagreement is already an issue for disagreement. So I think it's not an easy thing to do. We, we are working at it and we've made some progress in the negotiating process. But I think it's better to be talking and working towards this rather than abandoning this and actually coming to blows on the ground. So, uh, can I ask you a bit about Hong Kong, a yes. place which is often compared with Singapore as you know, two great financial hubs of Asia? And to what extent, you know, is there any kind of numbers you can give which give some indication of what everyone seems to think is that people are coming out of Hong Kong and going to Singapore? I, I haven't seen a large flow of people coming out from Hong Kong to Singapore. I mean, people travel back and forth, there's tourism, there's business, it continues to go on. I think the Hong Kong people for a long time have made their arrangements and um, have anticipated possibilities that they would need to be able to you know, operate with one leg on the ground someplace else. And uh, I don't think they were completely taken by surprise when this happened. When you look at what's going on in Hong Kong, do you feel more on the side of the government or more on the side of the protesters? I can understand the issues which lead people in Hong Kong to feel anxiety and uh, frustration and um, disappointment at uh, the, what the future holds for them. Because in fact, when housing becomes 21 times your annual income for a median house, for a median Hong Konger, it means you can't afford a house or even a space. And uh, that's a basic hygiene issue, it's not a higher order uh, want. From the higher order point of view, for, from being a significant part of Chinese GDP and, uh, well, at, in advance of China, now they are a small part of the Chinese GDP. And uh, China, if you look at Shenzhen, is not that far behind Hong Kong, in fact, in some respects, ahead of it. Uh, it's a very big adjustment psychologically to, to, to navigate and, furthermore, to have one country, two systems work properly and not come into friction with one another. Uh, that, I think, takes restraint and a lot of judgment and forbearance on both sides. Do you worry from Hong Kong's point of view that what is happening there is merely going to antagonize Beijing and it will, to some extent, be pushed to one side? I think the, I think the Chinese government is uh, very concerned about what's happening there. I don't think they know, quite know what they can do about it. They definitely know that if they go in themselves in a heavy-handed way, it's not going to be a wise thing for them to do and it's going to be counterproductive. Uh, and as long as it is within Hong Kong, well, they will just have to live with this problem. But ideally, at some point, as the temperature comes down and people cool down, it is possible for Hong Kong government to make progress on some of the basic issues which bug them. Uh, it's very hard. I mean, it's... They have tried to, but they haven't succeeded. But if they don't make some progress, it's hard to see how one country, two system can work for another 
28 years, 27 years. Can I ask you a bit about Singapore's role in this, this economy we've talked about? You know, as I said at the beginning, you are a free trading hub. You're one of those places which a lot of ships come through, yes. a lot of things go backwards and forwards. You now have a world where people, you can see it all the way around Davos, yes. people saying that they are dividing up their supply chains. Yes. They are looking at two things. One is on the whole getting things out of China that might go to America, because yes. even if this particular yes. row is slightly yes. dampening down, yes. it's getting harder. But the bigger yes. thing they're also looking at is having pan-Asian manufacturing supplies aimed at Asians. Yes. How, how does Singapore fit into that? Well, I think there will be some desire for companies to have a China plus one strategy. Mm. Be present in China, but also have a presence somewhere else. It could be Southeast Asia, could be India, could be Bangladesh. Uh, could even be further afield. You could conceivably be in some of the East African countries, for example, which are getting their governance and economy in order. Uh, I think direct displacement from China to Singapore of industries will not be significant because we're not in the same market mm. segment. And the kind of ma industries which are in China are not the sorts which are operating in Singapore. Our, our, our conditions are too different. But what we can do in Singapore is as China's presence in the region grows, and it could be manufacturing presence, it could be infrastructure, it could be part of their Belt and Road projects. Uh, we have a role in financing it, in uh, uh, hosting regional headquarters for it, in working with them, providing expertise, making sure that the projects go well. Uh, we have a, 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 an infra, infra, infrastructure capabilities working with the World Bank and um, we can cooperate with the uh, AIIB Asian But do you, but do you think bank. that Singapore's, I suppose some people would have depicted Singapore, especially in maybe your father's time, as a kind of entrepot between Asia and the West, a place which things came through in order to go from one to the other. Now you're becoming perhaps much more, once again, a kind of entrepot within Asia, that this is a... Well, we, we it's hope an Asian that it will not only be within Asia because all the Asian countries have such considerable links with America and with Europe. And if it is really within Asia and it is carved off as a block like that, uh, you, we may think that we are the centre of the world, but we are not the whole world. Yeah. Far from it. One thing which is definitely in the air at Davos, because lots of people are looking at it, the, the fake news laws. You post in the same place your original allegation or story and this correction, and people can make up their minds which is which, and, uh, and, uh, and the truth will out, I hope. How do you think phase two of the US-China talks will, will affect Singapore? I mean, they've had this sort of first phase which well, deals we, with a few I think everybody is relieved that you are, you've at least stabilised the position for a while. And now you've got to go further. And there are serious issues which have to be discussed on both sides. Mm. And uh, both sides have to make quite basic adjustments. On the one side, on the Americans, uh, psychologically, you have to make up your mind. Are you doing this because you want to keep a level playing field and make sure the Chinese play according to the rules of the game and may the best man win? Or are we doing this, are you doing this because you want to keep on winning and whatever rules of the game are necessary, you will uh, create those rules and to make that outcome? What is your instinct on that? Many people would look at the Trump administration and say that if Donald Trump stands for anything, it is America first, which by definition means no, America must finish first. No, America first means you do the best for the United States. So do you, do you do the best by prospering in a world where there are other countries who are doing well? Or do you do your best by being uh, a big country when in a troubled world? And I'm not sure that the second is a very good answer. So that's one big thing which Americans must make up their minds. And I think they have not made up their minds even within the administration. And if, it is, if you say you need a level playing field and proper rules, then I think there's a potential to talk. On the Chinese side, I think they have to make up their minds that they are going to be constructive players in the global economy and in the global committee of nations. And that therefore, rules which 
were acceptable to other countries when they were smaller and less um, dominant and now have to be revised and renegotiated. And it can be r r rules on trade, it can be rules on intellectual property, it can also be international uh, diplomatic, really not laws, but norms, how you conduct yourself in a way that after decades as a major power, people still welcome you and do not consider you an oppressive presence. And if they're prepared to make that adjustment, which I think in the abstract they are, but when you come down to specific adjustments, it's not so easy for them to concede and voluntarily step back from what they feel they can hold on to for a while longer. But if they're prepared to make that adjustment, then between the US and America, and not just the US, but really the Europeans and everybody else and China, there is some possibility of working out a modus vivendi which will be stable and constructive for the world. Can I ask you a couple of last things just about inside Singapore at the moment? One thing which is definitely in the air at Davos because lots of people are looking at it, the, the fake news laws. Yes. Various people, including the tech companies, are looking yes. and saying what kind of fake news, news laws should people have? Yes. You have them. Yes. Yesterday I saw you, 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 put out a, you, you say you're going to put a correction order on a Malaysian thing which has complained about yes. executions. It didn't complain about executions. It made outrageous allegations about how executions are supposed to be taking place. But do you think, but do you just, just in general, do you think that is the way in which governments should proceed? I mean, there's, some people will say that the fake news is all about other governments trying to interfere and push well, there different are different things. aspects of this. There are, first, there are foreign, inter foreign operations, such as what uh, the Russians are alleged to have done in the US uh, in the presidential election or in Britain during Brexit, during the referendum. And that may or may not be fake news. That may be stirring up of vulnerabilities in your society and, and exacerbating existing fault lines and weaknesses in order to sharpen conflicts and contradictions and stoke social disorder. It happens. I mean, we're not Pollyanna-ish. We must acknowledge these things happen. That's one set of issues. What we have in, the, in our present legislation, it does not deal with that. It deals with a very narrow city problem, which is when untrue, deliberate untruths are posted online, which have public policy imp implications, public order implications, and which are false. And what do we do about them? Right? And what mainly the, what we do about them is we require the social media or the website, the platform, to post a correction which the government will provide and have a mechanism for that government correction to be challenged in court in an expeditious manner. And then you establish whether it's true or it's false and you post in the same place your original allegation or story and this correction and people can make up their minds which is which and, uh, and, uh, and the truth will out, I hope. Uh, one could hardly ask for greater transparency. I'll see one last question which is all about what happens to you. You've, you've said that when you're 70 you, you will step aside, which I think is in three years' time. Uh, I'm 67, go, coming on 68. That still remains my plan. And how would, you, how would you like people to look on your period of leadership? How would you like people to judge that? I think I leave it to people to judge. I've done my best. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully report it in the correct way. Prime Minister, thank you very much um, for talking to us. Um, thank you very us. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>